over. There we go. Thank you all so much for being here with us. I am just absolutely thrilled that I got the opportunity to get on this list of presenters who are coming to you um, over the next month uh, with our November theme of just being thankful for our direct care providers, our technicians, our RBTs, um, all those folks who really do support um, applied behavior analytic practice. And I am going to be talking a little bit about um, what organizational behavior management is. I know there's always a lot of interest around that particular topic among new practitioners because it might not be something that you've heard a whole lot of just yet in your career. And I'm hoping if I can get to you all so early, you will all find value in learning how to apply our science in multiple ways um, beyond just, you know, with the precious ones that you, you care for in your daily work, but also with each other, as Becca was saying. Um, I will get into a little bit about me in here in just a second. Um, I hope, I'm hoping some folks will maybe engage with me a little bit in the chat. Um, as we know, in this virtual world of presenting, it can be a little isolating to sit and talk at a screen. Um, so I do like to prompt for questions and things like that, but do feel free if you're just trying to relax, go ahead and relax. Um, and I will, I will take it away from here. So our two themes for tonight for this wonderful bonus session is an introduction to organizational behavior management. And we're gonna talk about some strategies that I use to identify potentially great employers in, in ABA. So I'm assuming most of you are working in uh, clinical behavior analysis right now, super excited for that. And of course, yes, first and foremost, I do wanna say thank you. Um, I was a technician before the, the RBT was a thing many years ago. Um, and even in my practice now, because I'm not a clinician, as, as Becca kind of pointed out a little bit, um, I don't practice clinically. I practice in teaching people how to lead and manage others, um, how to manage people's performance, how to develop systems. That's not where I started. I did start as a technician um, before the RBT was a thing. Um, we were known as behavior specialists at the time, many moons ago. and. Oh, very nice, Kate. So we've got more FIT folks, wonderful. Um, so many moons ago, I worked in an adult day training facility run by BCBA. So I worked with the adult populations. And then after that, I also worked with the, the little kids before I shifted into where I'm at right now. So I'm able to use that experience of having been, you know, on the front lines all the way into the back as a support, um, I try to help people understand that, you know, without you all, all of you in this room, we can't do what we do and reach nearly as many people. Um, we cannot change the world without you all. Um, unless we have a billion BCBAs, you know, we can't be in all places at once and you are wonderful um, helpers in making these positive changes happen. So I did just want to make a point of saying so much thank you. This is what this Lean and Learn has been all about. And I, I am no different, even though I'm not a clinician. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So a little bit about me. I'm Shannon Biaggi. I am a BCBA, uh, like Becca said, but I'm a BCBA with a focus on organizational behavior management. And uh, anybody in the chat, have you heard of organizational behavior management before tonight? Or have any education and training? So Paula has. Anybody else heard of OBM? Oh, it sparked your interest. Good, I'm so glad. Wonderful. So I'm not going to speak, be speaking an entire new language, hopefully, but oh, maybe I'll be bringing a little additional understanding because this is my sole practice area in OBM. Um, oh yes, wonderful. Uh, Michelle is, is fantastic. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I'm an independent consultant. Um, I own Chief Motivating Officers, which is a, what I call a micro consultancy. Um, and I'm also a frequent keynoter and an invited presenter on OBM topics. Uh, Becca and I often get to cross paths on the presentation trail. Um, we've presented at a number of conferences together. Um, and uh, actually she was one of the first people to invite me up to speak. Oh my gosh, 2017 maybe? 
up in up at the the business boot camp. Oh, Donna's got a master's in organizational management. Excellent. Um, I'm also an author on a textbook called Obium Applied. Um, that was a wonderful labor of love, trying to help people understand how to implement OBM beyond just reading about it in books. And finally, I am the director of operations for the ABAI Special Interest Group. So the Association for Behavior Analysis International's Special Interest Group in Organizational Behavior Management, and we're called the OBM Network. We have about 250 folks right now. And we're getting ready to release a bunch of new, new awesome stuff. So if you're interested in OBM, especially for students, it's only $49 a year. Um, and you get access to the Journal of Organizational Behavior Management, which definitely um, is a very low cost for getting access to an academic journal full of wonderful, wonderful research. Some interesting things about me, not that I really need to be that interesting, but I do live in a tiny house on wheels and less than 200 square feet. Um, we moved in right before the pandemic. We did not anticipate a pandemic when we were building a 200 square foot living space. Um, so that's been a unique challenge. Um, I, I'm speaking now from an even tinier tiny house that I purchased recently that serves as my home office. Um, and both are on wheels, which is super fun. Um, I was a professional singer. And I think Becca alluded to that at the beginning when we were talking about music playing in the background. So I, I was a professional singer and I play uh, ukulele, the mandolin, the guitar. I play a little piano. Um, so I, I'm, I love music more, more than most anything. And my deep, dark secret is I watch cat videos on YouTube every single night without fail. Um, I don't know that I can sleep anymore without watching at least one cat video before I go to sleep of them doing silly things. So that's just interesting things about me. I think sometimes our presenters get a little bit detached from, or they're, they're viewed almost as humans who aren't human anymore. Um, and I'm really just a regular, you know, uh, early 30 something person who still YouTubes and lives in weird tiny spaces. So just really happy to be here. <laughs> so let's talk about OBM. So organizational behavior management, and I'm so excited that so many of you are interested in this so early in your careers. Um, so organizational behavior management is considered a subdiscipline within ABA practice. So what you know of behavioral science, we are within the applied behavior analysis practice. But instead of focusing on changing uh, folks with autism behavior or you know other developmental disabilities, um, we are working on changing the work environment and focusing on improving employee performance and workplace culture. And that's how the BACB defined it in 2019. Our practice and research encompasses a wide array of strategies. There are countless different strategies that you can use um, in OBM and we're applied across a number of different industries all with the mission to improve the lives of the staff members and the lives of the clients that we're serving. Um, and we balance that out with also achieving business results for the organization. So ultimately, even though I'm coming in and I do defend the technicians, I will always speak up when I think a, a policy or a system is going to be unfair. We do need to balance that out with, we have to keep the doors open so that everybody can continue to thrive. Within, within the organization. So OBMers strike a very delicate balance between get the employees everything that they need and also make sure the doors stay open and clients get what they need as well. So OBM has a number of sub-disciplines within the sub-discipline. And I'm so excited you're, you're interested in OBM and primarily what people have heard of when they hear about OBM is performance management. So performance management is your typical antecedent behavior consequence, looking at an individual staff member's behavior to determine why do they do what they do. And I do a lot of practice in the performance management space, but I think what some folks don't understand um, or haven't been exposed to as much is OBM is a lot more than this. Um, I think another reason this happens is that the primary textbook used in organizations organizational behavior management um, courses is performance management by Dr. Aubrey Daniels, who founded the Journal of Organizational Behavior Management. He essentially named our field. 
So the relationship between the two becomes very blurry at times. So when most people come to me asking about OBM, they're actually asking about performance management. But there's also this area called behavioral systems analysis. So behavioral systems analysis is a three-leveled approach where performance management is only one of the uh, levels that we work at to create change in an organization. We also analyze processes and figure out our processes running efficiently and effectively like they need to be. And we also operate at the organization level. So do we have proper mission and values? Is there competition outside the organization that influences what we're doing inside the organization? So we operate at the organizational, the process, and the performance management level. And it's a much more um, 360 wraparound approach to creating behavior change in an organization. So that's behavioral systems. And you might notice I said performance management is contained within behavioral systems, and that is true. So performance management is technically a subdiscipline within the subdiscipline within the subdiscipline. And we've got these matryoshka dolls of, of wonderful systems work. Then there's behavior-based safety. Behavior-based safety is applying the concepts and principles of behavior management to safe behavior. And that includes how do we get people wearing hard hats on construction sites? If you think about it, nothing bad usually happens if I don't wear my hard hat on a construction site the vast majority of the time. Um, maybe the hard hat is super uncomfortable and I don't want to. Um, maybe I have to go out of my way to go get the hard hat, to go on the construction site. Um, behavior analysts are brought in to figure out, well, how can we change this up so that people will engage in this behavior that seemingly has no positive consequences um, and only has negative consequences that occur immediately. Um, I really respect the folks who play in behavior-based safety. This is probably the only one of these places I do not. I am super confident in my abilities as a practitioner, but not enough to risk someone's life on it. Um, maybe someday I will get there, but not now. Oh yeah. Uh, monetary incentive systems. So these are things like pay for performance. Um, this is not like commissions that you would get in like a, a, a um, selling relationship with an organization. It's looking at a multi, multi-metric kind of approach to figuring out how people can receive monetary incentives. This is a very popular space right now. Um, um, Dr. William B. Abernathy is the, the man to read if you're interested in these monetary incentive systems. His sin of wages will blow your mind if you can, if you can make it through the book. Um, so monetary incentive systems are great. Consumer behavior analysis, marketing. How do we get people to engage in purchasing behavior? Um, I've played in this space primarily in a, an e-commerce uh, role. And it's really interesting to see how we can influence just based on the way that we write about a product, the way that we use images with the product um, in physical stores, where we place products, whether they're close together or far apart. Um, peanut butter and jelly will always be near each other in an aisle for a reason and close by the bread, because if you put them all together, they all will, all of their sales increase together. Um, consumer behavior analysis is great. Um, Dr. Gordon Foxall is your guy for that particular topic as well. Chocolate and red wine, right together, 100%. Uh, and crackers and cheese. <laughs> Uh, training and development is another area, and this particular subdiscipline within the subdiscipline within the subdiscipline um, shows up in the other ones as well. But in typical business, it is such an emphasized area of practice where this is actually the space you'll find most OBM practitioners in other types of business that aren't human services, because we're excellent at teaching. Behavior analysis is the science of learning and how people and, and animals and other everybody learns. So you'll find a lot of behavior analysts that aren't BCBAs are working in training and development departments. And then subsequently, how do we measure the behavior that happens after training to make sure that training was effective? 
Health and wellness is another space that they've nested under organizational behavior management. Um, this includes things like getting people to engage in healthier behavior, getting people to engage in um, doctor prescribed routines, such as you know, diabetes, care, diabetes care, heart care, um, all of those wonderful, wonderful practices. And then last is leadership and culture. Leadership and culture is all about how do I change my behavior as a leader to influence everyone else's behavior. This is a little different than just performance management or systems because now I'm focused on solely one individual and seeing how I can influence their behavior to influence everything else. Um, and typically that behavior is what we reinforce. Um, Kate says, I also work for weight WW, formerly Weight, Weight Watchers, they use a lot of behavior anal analysis and concepts. I've noticed that in a few of the, the dieting apps. Um, I've looked at some of the background of like Noom. Noom has a lot of things that are sound from a behavior analytic perspective, which is interesting. Uh, Samantha asked, do you mostly work for one organization at a time or is it several? Um, several. <laughs> I work, I, I looked at my client list. I've got about 42 folks that I work with within a particular month. Um, and also, are there certain organizations you gravitate towards? I do. I gravitate towards human service organizations. I do work with some companies outside of our, our um, ABA folks. And I always go back to my roots. I always go back to remembering how it felt to be a technician myself and knowing that I'm, I'm less in interested in spreading my reach outside when I haven't fixed what's going on inside of our field. Um, a lot of OBM practitioners practice and they can charge, honestly, they can charge a lot more for it um, because ABA companies to be a little bit strapped because they're putting all their money and resources back into their, their clients, into their staff. Um, larger corporations don't, so they've got more expendable um, wealth to share. Um, so yeah, I hope I hope I answered that. And yep, uh, Becca and I have been working together for a very long time. I've done some some consultation. She taps me on the shoulder every so often to throw me a good question. Um, excellent questions, everyone. Keep them coming. More than happy to to answer your questions as we go. And Skinner did OBM work. A lot of folks don't realize that um, because our field focuses so so much on the very valuable services that we provide within the autism space, even Skinner acknowledged that uh, behaviorism has a place in the work of the workplace. And he talks about how our incentive systems are not reinforcing in typical organizations. Um, a paycheck is not a reinforcer, it's too delayed. So in, in almost verbatim what he says in this clip, I'm not gonna play it right now because it's a little bit long, is you know, a man doesn't work on Monday for something that he earns on Friday, he'd be a fool to do that. The man is working on Monday through Friday because he works under the eyes of a boss who can fire him. And all he's doing is trying to maintain his current quality of life. So it's actually an aversive that most businesses are built upon. So if we can shift that into systems where it's very positive. He says, um, everybody gets a big bang out of it. And I just love that quote because it's so 1972. Um, we set up systems in which everybody gets a big bang out of it. Um, that is what makes a quality work culture. If we can focus more on positive reinforcement, less restrictions, more um, a little bit more freedom to do what you need to do as long as you're achieving the outcomes, all of those things lead to really positive um, working um, environments. So if you're interested in that, the title of that documentary is a, it's available on YouTube. Just look up business behaviorism and the bottom line, and you'll be able to watch BF Skinner talk about some of his work at an air freight organization. Let's see, just want to get the participants panel up so I can control any unmuted microphones. All right. So this is a list of my recent or current projects, the, the types of organizations that I'm currently working in. Um, yes, I do emphasize a lot in that human service space, um, but I've done some stuff with the Girl Scouts of America out of California. Um, they were having an issue with retention of adult volunteers. Um, we found out that nobody had any 
um, training in how to manage other people. So the adults would get into a lot of conflict. Nobody knew how to resolve that conflict. And they were unable, initially they contacted me saying that we've got a girl retention issue. It didn't turn out to be a girl retention issue. They weren't, they weren't keeping the adults. And when the adults left, the girls left too. So um, you can't have one without the other. So those projects are very cool. Um, I work with a global architecture firm on getting increased compliance with their um, conflicts of interest reporting systems. So we had to map out the process and determine what what um, inefficiencies were resulting in folks not submitting their um, conflicts of interest. Um, this organization has well over 2000 employees across the globe. Um, and it's really important that uh, you make sure there's no conflicts of interest when you're building giant structures for people. Um, I work with an e-commerce company and we did an analysis because they wanted to bring on a new job role and they didn't know how to justify that. So we did an analysis of all of the tasks that everyone was doing and what would this network integration specialist do? Um, and we ended up concluding that it would more than pay for itself. And they created a new job role in this e-commerce and logistics company. Uh, visual pharmaceuticals. Um, we had a uh, six foot long process map of their legal and compliance process uh, for getting their uh, visual pharmaceuticals approved um, and they figured out that they could remove about three people out of the process and get it down to just about two regular pages instead of six feet of paper. Um, so that was super interesting. They were out of Switzerland. Uh, cybersecurity, I'm doing leadership development and coaching with a cybersecurity company who's got a set of managers who are managing for the first time. I worked with a charter fishing company out of North Carolina. We did some staff training, we did some service marketing, and we were looking at expanding the business at the time. Um, I worked with a nonprofit for adults with autism in South Carolina. We, they started from scratch with me, so we used the behavioral systems analysis framework to create their mission, vision, values, do their one, three, five year plan, do some strategic plans. Uh, I worked with school districts in Maryland. Um, they had no feedback systems at the district level, so we input systems and structures for folks to receive feedback um, in a more streamlined and more structured, um, scheduled way. I worked in corrections facilities in Australia. Uh, they had no job descriptions for, for the folks who were working, and this was an interesting one because the folks in this facility had developmental disabilities. They had been arrested and put in prison, some for things as extreme as murder, and they had no structure for the job descriptions um, or the expectations for those roles or any kind of way that they evaluate the performance of these folks. And this is a very high risk space to work in. Um, so we were able to make some good job descriptions, expectations and evaluations. Um, I work with a canine behavior consulting firm in Pennsylvania. Um, so we're developing uh, training packages for animal shelters on how do you train your volunteers? How do you keep your volunteers motivated? Um, we also did mission, vision, mission, vision, values, and strategic planning for the consultancy itself. Um, I work with a psychologist out of Australia doing performance scorecards. I work with a hospital in Texas. The uh, chief of staff give us any issues that he comes across. We troubleshoot with him. We've taught him how to use the performance diagnostic checklist. We've taught him how to process map. It's very, very cool. Um, I work with a graduate level, graduate level business school out of Ohio right now. Um, we're trying to increase the quality of class participation. They do a lot of um, case studies. So how do we get people really engaging with the case studies rather than kind of staying quiet in class? Um, and it turns out providing them a structure and like a, a discussion guide help to increase the uh, quality of participation in, in the business school, which was fabulous. Uh, tons of human service companies, too many to count. Um, and all even more than this, and these were just in the last about three years that I started working with these. So this is behavioral science getting outside of our space. Um, and I'm just so excited that I get the opportunity to show folks, you know, and positive reinforcement works. Um, all of these um, 
different strategies, we can apply them with clients and we can apply them with our employees and our staff members, you know, our colleagues. Um, so just really happy to, to get to have these opportunities. So ABA and OBM, because our origins come from the same place. So Skinner's radical behaviorism, the concepts and principles are conceptually very similar. There is no great deviation between clinical ABA practice and OBM from a conceptual standpoint. Uh, in fact, uh, Luke Carr and Wilder found that 44 out of the 48 task list items on the fifth edition task list for folks who are getting certified, you can do all 44 of them within an OBM practice. Um, so similar to our clinical ABA counterparts, we need operational definitions. We need to make sure that we are describing things in a way that's objective and measurable. Multiple folks observe the same thing, especially think about your performance evaluations. If I observe something differently than another supervisor, it's really a coin flip as to how your evaluations are going. Um, if we can't agree to what the operational definition of a well-performed discrete trial is. Um, so we have to make sure we've got those clear definitions. We use the ABCs. We have our three-term contingency, our antecedents, our behaviors, and our consequences. We use motivating operations and discriminative stimuli, reinforcers and punishers. Hopefully I'm not speaking too much of a different language because I know some of these are quite advanced concepts. Um, but all of these different variables that influence behavior, we use them too. They just look a little bit different. And we're focused on um, manipulating the environment. So even ABA business owners will come to me and say, you know, my staff members are just so lazy. And I will pause and say, okay, can you put your behavior analyst hat back on? Because that's a hypothetical construct. Um, what do you mean lazy? What are you seeing? Oh, well, they play on their cell phone instead of, you know, engaging with the client. So that's different. That's a different behavior entirely. I can measure and observe and intervene on that. I can't measure and observe and intervene on lazy. Um, so we need to make sure that we're redirecting away and not forgetting that core behavior analytic concept of measurable, observable behavior. Um, and we fall into these labels so quickly um, when we're leading other people. So I encourage you, practice not doing that. Or at least when you say it, say, okay, I said lazy. What I mean, what I'm seeing that's making me say this is X. And then you can slowly break that habit. We also do functional assessments. I mentioned for a moment something called the PDC, the Performance Diagnostic Checklist. It helps to term relationships between environmental stimuli and the way that people perform on the job. Um, it's, not, it's not overly similar to our clinical counterparts because the, the behaviors look very different between clinical ABA and organizational behavior management, but we still have those tools. Um, and then data, data, data. We have so much data. We, I would say that um, OBM practitioners have even more data that we get to play with because we get to also play with turnover and retention data, financial data, efficiency data. This is very cool. Um, and we don't guess on whether our interventions are working. We have the data to support that just like clinicians do. And then the last piece is that social validity. So I need to make positive change for everyone involved, not just the business owners. Um, that's why I'm so intent on making sure that technicians are taken care of. Because if you all aren't happy, we cannot, the, the environment is what, what you're responding to. So if you go and, you know, maybe you are kind of going halfway into your, your session, maybe you're exhausted and you're not being supported. Most folks who don't come from an OBM perspective will blame the staff and say, well, you're just, you're a bad staff member. An OBM practitioner will say, okay, what if, what's going on in the environment and how can I change this to make you more successful? Um, that's my objective is coming from a place of, we don't blame the employees. We figure out what's going on to the best of our ability and, and make those changes so everybody can be more successful. 
Stephanie says, this is all why I was so frustrated working at a clinic where operations side were not behavior analysts or OBM. Yep, very much so. Um, and you can have a behavior analyst also who doesn't um, utilize the science, doesn't generalize the science also to staff, and that can be equally as frustrating. All right, so we don't typically get certified. And I wanted to bring that up. It's one of the most frequently asked questions that I get is, you know, when I get my BACB certification, am I now qualified to be an OBM practitioner? And well, honestly, OBM practitioners don't typically get certified. And that's because oops, uh, there's no demand for a BCBA in a business. Nobody knows what BCBAs are right now, except for in clinical services. So no one is seeking those out. Um, and credentialing was established to protect sensitive populations. These businesses tend to be less sensitive than say a child with autism would be. Um, other things are that it doesn't differentiate me from another provider or a creden uh, the credential doesn't differentiate me from other professionals. So once I say that I'm a specialist in behavior science, that's enough. They don't need to know you're a board certified behavior analyst. Um, usually when they see credentials or letters and they don't recognize them, what they see instead is dollar signs. And then they won't want to consult with you anyways, because they think you're, you're, you might be too expensive. And then additional regulation means additional resources for finding really good continuing education in OBM is a struggle. It's also expensive to get the certification and maintain it if it's not differentiating you between other competitors and there's no demand for it. Um, so you don't necessarily need to be supervised. I've taken on supervisees who will um, opt to not sit for their boards. And because they found that OBM was really their passion, they're excellent analysts and it's not a weakness for them to have opted out, but they just want another direction. And I encourage one of them got into a uh, MBA program to supplement their behavior analytic education. Um, one of them got an operations position and is absolutely killing it as a leader within her organization without the certification. Uh, have you seen scrum masters and agile leaders in, in the field? Yes, yeah. So uh, both of those things do come up along with Lean and Six Sigma. Um, there's the, the crossover between some of these business certifications. You just need to make sure you keep your behavior analytic hat on when you go into those other certifications. So yeah. And as of December 2020, I'm anxiously awaiting the next update to see how much we're growing. So the first one of these pie charts that I received, there was 32 of us. Now there is 236 of us represented in the sample. Of course, this is only sample data. Um, this is only 79% of BCBAs. And there's 236 or 0.69% of us who work in OBM. Do you have to be a BCBA but work in OBM? You don't have to be a BCBA to work in OBM. Many of us are not. Like I mentioned in training and development departments, you'll find folks with degrees in things like organizational behavior management or applied behavior analysis, but they're not certified. So it's not necessary. It is, for me, I like to see it because it at least shows a base level of understanding of human behavior in general. And then I can build upon that. Whereas if you're coming to me and you don't have at least a degree in something relevant to OBM, I don't know where you're at until I put you through some kind of, I actually do have a test that I put my supervisees through to make sure that they've got their OBM stuff down. All right, and clinical behavior analysts are going to be doing a lot of things, wearing a lot of hats, and we'll be doing a lot of things, including a lot of OBM related tasks like dealing with employee engagement and turnover and hiring and testing competencies, assessing clinical outcomes, getting business results, having efficient billing and doing scheduling. A lot of these things are OBM repertoires. So that's why I encourage anybody who's interested in becoming a behavior analyst, you don't have to love OBM. OBM is gonna pop up in what you're doing. So I encourage you to at least tolerate. I, I have some folks that I work with who actively really dislike OBM. And I don't, I don't quite get it, um, but you know they tolerate it in order to meet the needs of their staff. So we've seen a huge increase in behavior analysts because 
of the insurance mandates that came down the pipe. So we can see around 2013, our line got a lot steeper than where it was projected to go if we had just stayed the course. The issue that comes with that is that now we've got a lot of people requiring leadership and supervision, and we don't have a lot of supervisors who have a lot of experience. Um, and some of those OBM repertoires are developed if you're not receiving actual uh, formal education in OBM, they're developed over experience where you're contacting some of sometimes not so great contingencies for some of your leadership behaviors. And when you have someone who's only been certified for a short time, they haven't developed those repertoires yet. Um, so OBM can kind of bridge the gap if you can at least acknowledge some of these OBM skills. I hope that learning some OBM can bridge the gap between older, more experienced supervisors and those with less experience. So the increases in businesses in ABA, leaders in ABA, these new supervisors requires entire new behavioral repertoires for our field. And without getting these behaviors, without learning how to motivate your staff and remove barriers and create systems, the best behavior plan in the world is only an expensive stack of paper. If you as technicians aren't motivated, um, if you as technicians don't understand why this work is critical and it's not on you, it's not on you, it's on the folks who are leading you to make, to help you see where this is going. And without you, again, expensive stack of paper um, and your clients aren't going to make any progress. So I really encourage you to adopt some, some OBM learnings. And then if staff don't enjoy work, employees reduce their work effort. So now they're not enjoying the experiences they're getting. They're um, passing this on to your clients. So less work effort means less quality in the services provided to your clients. That means less positive outcomes for those families that ultimately damages the organization. Um, and sometimes there's more incidents or negative behaviors exhibited towards clients. Um, you'll typically see those pop up in the newspaper every so often um, that somebody has done something that they shouldn't have and that's tied to folks, the contingencies are wrong. And then the supervisor becomes miserable too because the staff aren't happy. You can't seem to get staff to do what you need them to do because you don't have the necessary repertoires. And then everybody is struggling all together. And then staff don't show up, they quit their jobs. Your supervisors stop showing up. They may also quit their jobs and it damages the field. Um, so we need to ensure that we know how to build these positive reinforcing organizations. So now we're gonna talk about some of the things that I look for in those amazingly run organizations. And some of this is based on my experience. Some of this is based upon what we know from the you know, conceptually systematic pieces of OBM. And we've got about 15 minutes. So you can always look for external evaluations. So you might see badges from either of these organizations like the Council of Autism Service Providers from the Behavioral Health, Self Behavioral Health Center of Excellence. Um, Becca, I'm unsure if there are other external evaluations available for ABA organizations. I think these are the two big ones right now. There's ones that are larger than ABA, like JCO or other, um, but I think these are the two currently that are specific for um, ABA. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so this can be a starting point. I wouldn't make this the ending point because no um, auditing system is perfect. A full disclosure, I used to audit for the Behavioral Health Center of Excellence. I have learned where holes can be found um, in systems and processes, even at this level. However, this can be a good place to start if you're going in blind, looking for quality companies potentially to work for. And in no particular order, I'm gonna talk about a few questions that I would consider asking and getting the answers to. So these first set are what I call my deal breakers. These are things that if the answers don't quite go in a certain direction, I would probably just walk away. Um, 
it's it's you'll understand when we get through it why these these are kind of deal breakers for me the rest of the questions after that give or take you know nobody's going to be perfect these are ones where i i draw a pretty good line that i would say go ahead and don't don't stay so my first one is going to be if they're hiring technicians as independent contractors becca understands why now these are deal breakers um you cannot be an independent contractor. You have to be supervised by a BCBA. It is actually illegal for them to hire you as independent contractors, I believe in most states, if not all states. I think it is actually federal law. There are companies out there that do it. And that would be a huge red flag. Just walk away, you know, and they can make it sound very appealing um, because typically an independent contractor rate is higher on paper. Um, but you're also missing out on the appropriate supervisory supports. You're missing out on benefits that you should be given if you're working the number of hours. Um, where do you report them if they're doing this? I would recommend maybe talking to them first. Um, as with our ethical code, you probably want to chime in and say, you know, have a conversation first, but this would be reported to the IRS, um, unfortunately. So that's where you would ultimately go after that conversation if you're unable to make any headway. So technicians should not be hired as independent contractors. Is there a non-compete? So be very careful. Make sure you read your contracts very carefully. This one is not illegal. Um, they can be not enforceable. So um, to back up, a non-compete means that you cannot work for another organization. And depending how it's written, it's either you can't work for another organization while you're working for them or and or. Um, you can't work for an or another organization for a certain period of time after that provides a competitive service. Um, I ended up under a non-compete myself, not in the clinical ABA space, this space, um, but I was under a two-year non-compete that I couldn't do certain things that I really, really wanted to do. Um, so if there's a non-compete, I recommend reading very carefully as to what the terms are because they should be stipulating a certain amount of time that you're under the non-compete and they're supposed to stipulate a geographic area. And if you see, oh, if I quit this job for any reason, I would have to move 50 miles away from my home to start working in my field again. Um, that's the reality of some of these non-competes. Stephanie says, I interviewed at 22 different places in Nova and all but two had a non-compete. Yeah, it can be it can be a little bit difficult. Um, so learning to read contracts, nobody tells you that in school. You need to read every word of the contracts that you sign when you're taking a job um, with a company. Um, another one is anti moonlighting. So this is a different one, less uh, common, but anti moonlighting means that you just can't work another job in the field uh, in the similar and sometimes it's in any other job my red flag sometimes it's okay so if they've got an anti-moonlighting policy it could be tied to we don't want you to get burnt out we want to make sure that you're um, you're not getting spread too thin but if that's tied with low hours where they've limited you to only you know 10 hours a week um, they're essentially saying you can't work anywhere else and i'm only going to give you 10 hours a week so they're kind of committing you to poverty um, so again, being very careful to see, do they have an anti-moonlighting policy um, where you can't work another job at the same time? Um, and sometimes that even includes like working as a waitress or waiter or wait staff. Um, it doesn't have to just be an ABA, whereas the non-compete is directly about competing with the organization's services. Are employees required to transport clients? In a lot of places, that's not okay either. And the board has said, that, that is that is outside the scope uh, and is legally questionable. So if they talk about you taking clients in your car, you, you may want to, again, consult with, when in doubt, always consult with a lawyer. I know that's not uh, fiscally possible for a lot of folks, um, but if you have it before you take a job position, um, consult with somebody and ask them some of these questions based on your state. Um, does the company have any open litigation lawsuits or a history of unethical behavior that's documented? Not to say that organizations can't change. However, you can 
maybe wait it out a little longer until some of this stuff has been resolved. Nobody talks about burnout except Dr. Becca. <laughs> yeah, burnout's, burnout's a big deal. Um, and that's, that's another one of my questions a little later. Uh, do they hire people with no experience with the population they serve? This is not a deal breaker every time, um, but it can be if they're bringing on a lot of people with no experience in combination with insufficient training before folks are independent with clients. Um, those two things together are an absolute disaster. And I've seen it personally with the organizations that I used to work for. They would hire pretty much anyone, regardless of experience. And we were with clients within two days um, by ourselves. And that's not a good combination. So I typically say either make sure that you're hiring folks with sufficient experience, even if it's one year, six months, something or you have sufficient training and observation time before you're by yourself um, because that's not setting anybody up for success that's going to be a really stressful position for you to be in um, whether you're the person who has no experience at the time or all of your colleagues have no experience because sometimes that's going to end up landing on you to pick up some of the uh, slack and really detrimental to the clients for sure uh, and this is why OBM is so important, I feel, in combination with self-care and other tactics, burnouts could be minimized. You got it. Uh, and then the last thing is, is data collected on staff performance before they have them serve clients independently? So do we have the data to support that this person is ready to go off on their own? This one, it really is a deal breaker for me if you're not actually assessing performance before sending folks off on their own. I could put it on another slide, but for me, it's a deal breaker. All right, now these are not deal breakers. These are still some, some flags, um, if not red, maybe some kind of soft pinkish, maybe a salmon colored flag. Um, what is the staff to supervisor ratio? So do you have 20 people that you're leading and managing? Um, or do you have 20 other colleagues that you're competing with for a supervisor's attention? Um, you want to make sure that that's not not um, too many people for one one supervisor to handle. Um, you might ask how many years the supervisors have been certified. Um, if nobody on the floor has more than a year of experience, that's probably you might want to let that company grow a little bit more before you jump in, especially if you're you're fairly new to the field. If you've already got past experience and you and you're confident in what you're doing, you might be able to do okay in some of these spaces where there's a lower um, or a higher staff to uh, supervisor ratio and you've got younger supervisors, I still would would probably pass. Um, is there documented onboarding and training or are they kind of winging it and hoping that you're catching on? Um, checklists, even, even just a checklist of here's the things that we're going to have you do. That's better than you know, we, we play it by ear with each person as they come on. Your smaller developing organizations might not have this yet. Um, so again, that's why it's not a deal breaker, but it's something that can be a red flag if they're like, no, we just kind of wing it, you know, welcome. Is data collected on staff behaviors and accomplishments on a monthly basis? Do they observe you and collect data and provide reinforcement based upon that? Um, if a lot of organizations aren't collecting a lot of staff behavior data. Um, that's why they bring me in to figure out what they should be collecting data on. Um, but this can be another red flag, especially when it comes to things like promotions or um, if they've got to pay for performance system, um, we have to have uh, sufficient data on staff behavior. Um, how often and for how long are staff observed by a supervisor? Um, I audited a company out of Miami where they said they hadn't seen their supervisor in two months, and she worked upstairs, um, and it was kind of a kind of a wild situation. Um, I wasn't expecting them to be so honest, but usually um, it's recommended uh, an hour or two a week is probably good, especially early on in your um, career, and it can it can fade out from there, but not without the data from the previous question. Um, that should should be used to determine when we start fading out uh, supervision. Uh, how often are you getting formal feedback? And that includes positive and constructive. What I typically wanna see is at least 
it's weekly some kind of feedback being given to staff, um, even if it's not formal, at least weekly informal feedback, even if it's just you did a nice job with whatever this thing was that you were doing. Um, how often are we doing formal reviews of performance? So in the chat, how, how often do you think or have you seen most companies reviewing staff performance? How often do you get a performance review, if at all? Ooh, three months. Oh, we've got an every week, nice. Formal once a year, 90 days, one every month. All right, you've got some good stuff going on. Not too bad. Uh, typical organizations are doing the annual review. Um, Taylor went for two without a formal performance review. So if I see annual reviews, that could be a sign that there's not a lot of um, OBM education and training in the leadership team, um, because that is typically not something that we want to see. It's too infrequent to get um, positive behavior change from staff. Um, Stephanie says, my old company did a really lackluster, bleh, lackluster, poorly done uh, Monthly, that was a joke. We do weekly training at my company and that's also a check-in and official operation review. Nice, every six months. Yeah, so just make sure it's not annual. Even six months is a little bit of a stretch. Uh, are they based on data or is it on a scale of one to five, how am I doing? Those two things are very different. Um, that's probably another one of the more red flags for me is if all the, the data that is collected on staff is on a scale between one to five, how do you feel about how I'm performing? We know as behavior analysts, we need to be using data. Um, what reinforcement systems currently exist and are they based only on billable hours? If the reinforcement systems at the organization are based only on billable hours, that's another one where I'd probably opt to look elsewhere. Um, we need to balance out the quality of services with those billable hours. Um, so I would recommend not, not opting in for that. Um, is staff performance compared to others or to their own past performance? Creating competition within a company, especially based on performance, is also not recommended in the OBM literature. I'm moving a little faster because I don't want to keep us too long after the time. Um, so what kind of non-descriptive or anecdotal data would you take for RBTs? Um, I don't usually collect anecdotal data. I will figure out and operationally define and measure the actual behavior, um, but that's a whole other conversation. All right, mission statement and values. How do they measure quality of clinical services? Do they? Um, are they using the same assessments across all of their clients? Are they copying and pasting goals and programs without making edits? Are caregivers involved? Um, are staff members penalized when caregivers and clients cancel? Huge red flag. And that's something that I would ask up front. Um, are there ongoing learning opportunities for staff? Is there room for growth within the role? Um, do they provide you unrestricted activities to do? Um, and are they compensated? If, if the unrestricted opportunity is benefiting the organization in any way, they have to pay you for it legally. So that would be another really great question to ask is do you pay for unrestricted time that benefits the company? Um, that again gets into uh, legal issues. Uh, Sam, I'll come, or Samantha, I'll come back uh, in just a second. Um, what's the current rate of turnover and retention? I would probably only get nervous at maybe 70% or more. Anything less than 70 is at least within industry standards, which we shouldn't just accept, but we do. Um, is the owner a BCBA? And if not, do they have a clinical director with five or more years of experience? Um, this is debated you know, back and forth of whether it's better to have a business owned by a BCBA or a business owned by somebody who knows how to run a business. Um, I go back and forth. Um, are all of the people in supporting roles, including HR, related to the owner? You've got nobody objective you can go to, especially when HR also is, say, the spouse of the owner of the company. Uh, I know we're at the end of time. I'm just going to open these up. These get into more ethical issues related to posting um, Client photos, testimonials, using terms that they shouldn't be using, HIPAA. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably make something that's got some of these, these items on it. Um, the daily drive more than one and a half hours. 
that's not an ethical issue, but it is a burnout issue because I find that anybody who hits about more, about two hours of driving per day tends to get burnt out a little bit faster. Um, so all of these things that, that are in this list come at a cost. So sometimes that higher pay rate may mean less resources like supervision time might mean that you're driving more. It might mean that they're engaging in some less than ethical marketing strategies. It might mean that they're not respecting work-life balance for that dollar amount. So please keep all of these benefits in mind when you're comparing pay rates between your organizations. All right, I am so sorry, two minutes over. I really do wanna respect all of your time. Uh, find me on Facebook for more questions. Um, and that's it for this presentation. Whew. Thank you, Shannon. That was amazing. I am going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, sometimes folks feel more comfortable asking questions.